Good morning, everyone. My name is Masi Abi Maragheni, the Head of Business Development at Future Growth. I welcome you all to Future Growth's webinar, Reform of South Africa's Energy Sector, Pipe Dream or a Window of Opportunity. As you would guess, behind the switch on the wall, there is a multi trillion rand industry to produce and supply electricity to each of our homes and businesses. We've all come to find out that it is not as reliable as we would want, forcing government to get more involved than they ought to be if things were functioning well. Clearly, the changes of technology, changes of the economics, and the rise of a carbon-free future are forcing a consideration, a reconsideration. Yes, a rethink of everything we came to believe about electricity generation and transition. To discuss that, I have with me today, Chris Yellant, the Managing Director of EE Business Intelligence. Chris is a fellow of the South African Institute of Electrical Engineers, SAIEE. He's a senior member of the IEEE USA and a member of the IET UK. He's also a registered chartered engineer with the Engineering Council in the UK. And with him is my colleague, Paul Sample, the Portfolio Manager of the Future Growth Power Debt Fund, and Bongile James, our investment analyst that looks at the power sector. Please note that we will have questions and answer sessions at the end. Here, you can please stay onwards so that you can really have an informal discussion with us. In fact, our CRO, Andrew Cantor, will be joining us for that session as well. We also created a poll to pique your interest and to ensure that today, we will be addressing all the questions that have, you've highlighted are relevant to you. So be assured that between Paul, Bungile, and Chris, all your questions will be answered. So let's kick off. Chris, what is the current energy situation in South Africa and what has led to that? Well, uh, thank you very much, Masiabi. And um, may I say that probably the best way of answering is to take a look at this slide, which is going to be shown uh, now. Um, this is a slide uh, showing Eskom's so-called energy availability factor. It looks quite complicated, uh, but each colored graph uh, represents one year of energy availability factor data. And in sequence, you can see that uh, the trend for each year is one of rising energy availability factor in winter and dropping energy availability factor in summer as more maintenance is done in summer and less uh, of this generation capacity is therefore available in summer. But the interesting to, thing to note is that year by year, the energy availability factor trend is decreasing. Uh, and the bottom graph that you see right at the bottom uh, is the current year uh, to date up to week number 40. And you can see that the energy availability factor this year is consistently lower than it was last year. And in fact, in the last few weeks has taken something of a nosedive. Uh, and that's what resulted in the load shedding that we have seen. Uh, so you can see that the trend is not a pretty picture. And this gives you the state of the Eskom uh, generation fleet at this time. So uh, I think we know we have load shedding. Uh, it's a problem. Uh, and this really is an indication of the uh, performance of the coal fleet. Now, uh, the other thing, performance that I think is worth noting is the uh, environmental performance of the coal fleet. And you may have seen a report that came out last week that indicates that South Africa as a whole, the generation capacity in South Africa generates more sulfur dioxide emissions than the entire country of China and the entire country of the USA and indeed more than the whole of the European Union countries put together. And just remember that while South Africa is generating more SO2 than China, China has 23 times the population of South Africa. And I think this gives you an indication of just how bad uh, the environmental performance of Eskom's power stations are. And you know, uh, 20 years ago, China's SO2 levels were much higher than South Africa's but in the last 20 years, they've actually done something about it. And the SO2 level have dropped consistently year by year, while South Africa has effectively done nothing and remain exactly as bad as it ever was. 
So I think uh, really from a point of view of, uh, uh, of sustainability, we look at the three pillars of sustainability. Uh, firstly, uh, financial sustainability. We know that Eskim is in a dire state financially and is not a sustainable business. Uh, operationally, we're experiencing regular load shedding. That's a sign of the state of the operational performance. And lastly, the environmental performance uh, is really very poor uh, by global standards. I hope that gives an indication of the current status of the Eskom fleet. Absolutely. Thanks, Chris. Paul, I mean, there has been an experience of delays with procuring new energy. I mean, we've been talking about the Renewable Energy Independent Power Producer Procurement Program that was delayed and the emergency round. Can you talk us a bit more about what that delay is about? Yes, Masiabi, we've had a remarkable last 10 years. Um, looking back to 2010, uh, there was a lot of new energy coming on stream uh, in the renewable space coming into South Africa. And in fact, between 2010 and 2015, I think South Africa was one of the, the global leaders, certainly in terms of activity in the renewable space. Um, over 100 uh, different independent power producer contracts were awarded over that five years. But unfortunately, from 2015, the program stalled. This is the Renewable Energy Program. And nothing happened until 2018, until the round four uh, bids were, were eventually signed by ESCOM. Um, but we've been waiting for the last six years for the new bid window of Renewable Energy to open up. We're expecting the outcome um, of bid window five by the end of this year, but nonetheless, it's taken six years to get to this point. And um, there's also multiple small scale generators that, that are waiting for their contracts to be signed. Um, and we've had the emergency round that was announced uh, two years ago and the preferred bidders were, 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 were announced earlier this year, but there's now been concerns about the integrity of the process and that's now being stalled in, in, a, in, a, in a legal uh, hearing. So really, we've had a lot of promise, um, a lot of expectation, um, but there have been delays. And you know, the, the key thing is that these plans have not been executed as, as we expected. Um, the private sector has been waiting. Uh, they've put a lot of uh, capital into, into the energy sector, in, in particularly renewables. Um, which has helped to relieve power on the grid, but so much more could have been done if we had not had these delays over the last five to six years. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Bongile, take us through what has been done. Well, Masiabi, the Independent Power Producers Office, with the support of the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy, has procured about 6.4 gigs of gigawatts of renewable energy from 112 uh, renewable energy ind independent power producers across the four rounds of the renewable energy program. Now, of that 6.4 that has been procured, about 4.2 gigawatts of renewable energy is online and is produced by 67 independent power producers who are connected to the national grid. Um, in the context of South Africa, we installed gen generation from different fuel types is approximately 52 gigawatts. Coal accounts for 73%. Well, renewables that are online accounts for 8% of, of the installed generation capacity. Now, the program itself, the renewable energy program itself has deployed about 210 billion in capital. Now, both in debt and equity, um, with 20% of that coming in the form of international capital. Since 2011, as my esteemed colleague Paul has mentioned, there's been over four bid windows that have been rolled out, which have created 33% of shareholding by black people, 9% of shareholding by community trust where these projects are located, approximately 52,000 in jobs across both the construction and operation phases of these respective projects, and a spend of 1.6 billion in enterprise de de development and socioeconomic development initiatives where these communities are located. As mentioned, uh, bids for round five of the renewable energy program were recently submitted in August this year wherein 2.6 gigawatts of new energy, wind and solar will be procured 
and is expected to come online in the next 24 months. Okay, thanks for that, Bongile. You know, Bongile, we know that the government has actually raised the licensing threshold for embedded generation projects from about one megawatt to 100 megawatts. You know, is this necessary and is it efficient? Yes, you're correct in mentioning that, uh, Masyabi. Basically, what does that mean? This means now that a company like a mine can build, finance and operate its own power plant with a capacity of up to 100 megawatts without requesting a license from um, the National Energy Regulator of South Africa, which we commonly know as NERSA. Now, it may be, talking to necessity and efficiency, it may be far efficient and cheaper for this mining company to generate its own electricity. Um, this also, again, reduces dependence on ESCOM for power supply and helps the country diversify from diversify away from the renewable energy program, which is government-led, um, while, also, while also reducing the impact of load shedding on businesses and residents in the short to medium term. Okay. Chris, what is the solution to address the immediate crisis and also over the long-term horizon? I mean, we're talking about this integrated resource plan. Can you just speak to us about what that actually means? Yeah, look, the integrated resource plan for electricity is a national plan that looks at demand uh, over the next decade and more. It looks at the sources of supply. It looks at how much is going to come on stream uh, based on existing contracts and how much is going to come off stream uh, based on decommissioning. And then it works out year by year what is needed uh, in terms of new generation capacity to fill the gap between supply and demand, uh, noting the stuff coming on and the stuff coming off the grid. Uh, and, and this is a techno-economic study that is done and it needs to be done regularly. Uh, so the first thing we've got to do as a solution, uh, and there are uh, several issues that need to be dealt with, but we do need to implement our plan. And the problem is that this plan was uh, launched or promulgated in November or October 2019. And the problem is that since it was published, not a single kilowatt of new generation capacity has been procured in terms of this plan. Yes, there are requests for information, requests for proposals. Bid window 5 has come out, but no contracts have been placed for the construction of new generation capacity. And at the same time, there are significant gaps that are starting to appear in this plan. So, for example, there's 2,500 megawatts of hydropower sort of penciled in for 2030 uh, from the DRC, and we all know that that is not going to happen. Secondly, there's 1,500 megawatt of new coal power uh, in two tranches, 750 and 750 uh, a megawatt, totaling 1,500 megawatts uh, of new coal generation capacity that is supposed to come in in 2023 and 2027, respectively. And there are really serious doubts as to whether that will ever happen because banks and, and financial institutions like Future Growth uh, are not prepared to fund this uh, new generation, uh, coal generation capacity. So that's another uh, 1,500 megawatt uh, plus the 2,500 uh, that I was talking about. Now you've got a 4,000 megawatt gap on your hands. And add to that the fact that the new uh, gas uh, uh, IPP procurement program uh, is behind schedule and will not come on stream on time. Uh, and also the renewable energy IPP program and the risk mitigation IPP program are also behind schedule and will not come on stream according to plan. And now we're talking about a gap of about 6,000 megawatts that is not being fulfilled in terms of the plan. So we now have to start thinking about plan B. And really what that means is a new integrated resource plan for electricity that updates uh, the situation with the current realities, uh, taking into account these issues that I've just uh, mentioned. So just to give you an idea, but according to the current plan, the IRP 2019, um, uh, as has been said before, about 70% of electricity, 75% in fact, uh, comes from coal. And over the next 10 years, uh, that is going to reduce by a total of 11,000 megawatts as a result of the decommissioning of coal. And that's uh, coming off the stream, off the grid. 
And uh, the, the CEO of Eskom had indicated that in the next five years following 2030, in other words, in the years from 2030 to 2035, another 11,000 megawatts of old coal is going to come off the grid. So we've really got to start putting our mind together about what is going to replace the gaps that are there currently appearing, uh, the, this decommissioning of, of the old coal power plants uh, up to 2035, uh, what are we going to do to replace that? And also, what are we going to do about building new capacity to take into account the growth in the economy? And I presume we are expecting some growth in the next 15 years. So that is the challenge before us. Uh, the IRP is out of date. Uh, there are gaps. Things are not coming on and stream on schedule. It needs to be updated with a little dose of reality. And we need to put in place um, IRP uh, uh, 2022, you might call it. And this needs to be done as a matter of urgency. Paul, talk to me about the government and the policy. What can be done there? Mm. Well, I, I think what we are seeing at the moment, first of all, is that uh, public procurements are very, very slow. Uh, th that's what's causing a lot of these gaps. And we need to start looking at the private sector becoming part of the solution. And I'm pleased to say government has responded by raising the limit above which you need a generation license from 1 megawatt to 100 megawatt, a very significant jump. Uh, but it's not enough. It's not enough just to enable this. It has to be encouraged. It has to be uh, incentivized and facilitated so that it actually happens. Uh, so at the moment, what we've done is we've just allowed it. But that's the first step. And there are a number of other issues to actually make it happen. And we've got to, this is the only solution in the short term, I'm talking about in the next three years or so, uh, to fill the gaps in the IRP. Bungile, what about finances that is available? How much finance is available and where can we actually access it from? Um, Masiabi, we know that in, you know, in a time of climate change, capital markets want to assist in the necessary transformation of our economy, right? So sources of finance include international banks, development and finance, development finance institutions, local banks, local de development finance institutions, and institutional fund managers. Now, the competition for these financial flows is intense, and it's no secret that the window of opportunity to attract these is, 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 is closing. Um, dirty technologies have, as Chris has said, become far less attractive for capital markets, who have shown dying support for new built fossil fuel projects, while having specific timelines as to when they'll exit the existing fossil fuel investments. This means now that you know clean arrivals for of fossil fuels are set to draw more capital from these local uh, and international banks and institutions. Um, and what we know is that you know in in support of um, developing economies and their co commitments to COP26 and the Paris Agreement of 2015, um, develop, developing economies have pledged about or have promised rather about 100 billion dollars in 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 concessional finance uh for the next over the next five years um we talking to future growth uh, approach to 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 um well rather talking to future future growth approach as a source of finance um we have been firm in our approach and have declined new coal deals as far back as 2016. We have been supportive of the renewable energy program since its, its inception and as and are very supportive of this program as there has been no hint of malfeasance or any procurement irregularities. You know, the program is globally lauded as a success story and we are, we are of the view that this should be replicated as much as possible. Thanks, Bongile. Paul, do you want to talk about just, uh, you know, government stakeholders and policy? What do we need to do in terms of bringing that in alignment? So, Masiabi, we've spoken about plans for many years now. Um, really, the, the solution is to execute and execute quickly. Um, we really need to focus on, on the short term and prioritize bringing new energy onto the grid as, as soon as possible. Um, you know, we also need to remember South Africa's commitment to its Paris Climate Agreement. Um, and 
you know, if if we don't keep to that commitment, there's real economic costs for, for the country, um, particularly in terms of exports and, and carbon taxes being loaded onto um, the, the, the cost of exporting. Um, to date, we've really had too much reliance on, on ESCOM, which, which is a monopoly. Um, and thank goodness we are now starting to move to all sources of, of new generation that's located around the country. Um, we need to bring in the private sector. Um, the private sector has capital to invest in, in, in the energy sector. And um, we can't afford to be mobilized by backward looking um, concerns about where we've come from and, 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 and our coal legacy. Um, we need to look forward now. Thanks, Paul. Chris, what is technology South Africa considering in the IRP? Mm -hmm. Look, in the IRP, if you look at what has been proposed for the next uh, 10 years, that's to 2030, it's largely dominated by a blend of wind, solar PV, and flexible generation capacity in the form of battery energy storage and gas to power to complement and fill in the gaps uh, of the, uh, the variability uh, of renewable energy. Uh, so that forms the dominant uh, part of the uh, technologies proposed in the IRP. And it does this because, in fact, this is the least cost option. Now, obviously, on its own, wind and solar provide very low cost energy. But there is this variability that needs to be dealt with. And that is dealt with by blending in uh, flexible generation capacity. Uh, and the combination of this flexible generation capacity, uh, which comes at a higher cost, but together with the very low cost of wind and solar PV, gives you the least cost option as a package uh, to deliver the energy needs of South Africa for the next 10 years. But thrown into this mix is unfortunately what I call a little bit of smoke and mirrors. Firstly, there's this 2,500 megawatts of hydropower from the DRC. Nice idea. It's renewable uh, and uh, it doesn't emit uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, but uh, the problems are that this is likely not going to happen, certainly by 2030. Uh, I don't think anybody believes that it will happen any longer. Uh, and then, of course, there's this uh, 1,500 megawatts of new coal power. My personal belief is this was just thrown in uh, to keep the um, coal lobby quiet. Uh, but the chances of it actually hope happening are extremely remote. So uh, I think it, it, it's a, other than the smoke and mirrors, it's a rational IRP in the sense that it's dominated by renewable energy backed up with flexible generation capacity. And actually that is the least cost option going forward. And it also ticks the other boxes of least water use. Uh, it meets our CO2 uh, uh, commitments in terms of the Paris Accord. Um, it, it generates the most jobs and it uses the least water. So uh, all in all, it ticks all the boxes and comes in at least cost. And that is why it is the right solution for South Africa going forward. Thanks, Chris. So you alluded a bit to coal and gas. I mean, Bongile, do you want to maybe come in here and tell us, you know, speaking of technology alternatives, you know, renewable energy alongside battery storage could be the solution. And it's also considered to be what we call clean solution. How true is this? Well, Nasiabi, you know, as Chris has highlighted, I mean, renewable sources like wind and, and, and solar power can suddenly change with, with little warning. Um, so the ability to store intermittent power has, you know, become far more important. Um, it is true that a combination of renewable energy and battery storage system could provide the alternative in the form of clean base load in the short term. Um, when considering the cleanliness of the solution, one needs to think about what we call life cycle costs. These are cradle to grave assessments, which look at you know CO2 emissions or greenhouse gas emissions from resource extraction or harnessing of the resource all the way through to operations and decommissioning. You know, on this basis then of assessing uh, the life cycle assessment costs, it is factually incorrect to say that renewable energy has no carbon footprint, as studies have shown that, you know, per kilowatt of electricity generated, um, renewables 
both wind and solar have a carbon footprint during the manufacturing and uh, of the materials and components that are used in these parts. You know, however, again, on that cradle, cradle to grave uh, basis, um, these produce far lesser uh, greenhouse emissions than, than, than fossil fuels. May I come in here, Masi uh, yes, And please. just uh, talk, if I may just talk to the question of, of, of coal and, and gas. Yes, mm. gas is sometimes seen as a transitionary fuel um, uh, that can uh, uh, be very useful on the road uh, towards uh, solutions uh, involving other energy storage technologies, including battery energy storage, gravity energy storage, underground pumped water storage, and even surface uh, pump water storage schemes, uh, of which there are two that are being talked about in South Africa at the moment. Uh, the question, of course, on everybody's minds, uh, both coal and uh, gas, is their carbon footprint. Uh, and um, as has been pointed out uh, by Bong Bongili, uh, yes, uh, of course, every technology has some form of carbon footprint, especially during manufacture and decommissioning. Uh, but uh, what you're avoiding here is a lifetime of carbon emissions from the burning of coal or the burning of gas. And in the, in the, in the, the world of gas, uh, one must also take into account uh, the uh, methane emissions, the leakage that occurs from the point of uh, exploration and production. And in other words, taking the gas out of the ground, uh, liquefying it, uh, transporting it across the oceans, regasifying it, uh, and finally delivering it uh, to um, uh, to, to uh, uh, open cycle or combined cycle gas turbines uh, where it is burned. The emissions or the leakage of carbon dioxide is a greenhouse uh, of, of leakage of methane gas is a, is a, is a greenhouse gas uh, about 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide itself. So you take into account the leakage of methane plus the burning of methane and the CO2 emissions from the burning process. And you find that the CO2 emissions uh, from gas are in many cases as bad and sometimes even worse than the burning of coal. So I think we've got to realize that even as a transitionary fuel, it is not a solution to climate change. And we can only see this, I think, as a short term, shorter term solution. And therein lies the rub. The rub is of building expensive gas infrastructure, which may become stranded assets in the future. Mm. I mean, Bongile, talk to us about the costs, you know, that are involved with renewable energy as well. Um, so, Masiabi, when we talk costs, you know, we need to think affordability. So, we know that a combined solution um, of wind, solar, and battery storage costs roughly one fifty one one grand fifty five cents per kilowatt, while a combination of solar and battery storage is slightly more expensive, coming in at one grand eighty eight cents per kilowatt. You know, on a levelized cost of energy basis, which means if we think about the cost per kilowatt over the life of this of these respective plants, and when we compare these solutions to nuclear, which has levelized costs of roughly 250 uh, cents per kilowatt, and coal, which has levelized costs of 168 cents per kilowatt, it shows that, you know, a combination of renewable energy with battery storage could be a palatable solution when one talks about affordability. Okay. Paul, I mean, nuclear as a long-term efficient and green solution. Um, do you want to comment on that and also focus on green hydrogen as well? Because that's a new and emerging technology that's been spoken about, but has never actually been tested. Yeah, both those technologies are potentially long-term considerations, Masiabi. Um, you know, I think we should have the discussion about nuclear. And I know that's a bit of a sensitive debate, um, particularly given, you know, the recent past where the government tried to force nuclear down our throats. And, you know, I think the, the market has become a bit skeptical about that for, for, for that reason. Um, but South Africa does have some sort of competitive advantages for, for nuclear. And, you know, I, I don't think we should just not not consider it. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the the price of any technology, but including tech, uh, nuclear, is 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 critical, and it's it's the price to the consumer. So it's exactly what Bongile said now. 
Um, and any um, nuclear option should be explored. It, it, it needs to be um, bid for on an on a open, transparent, competitive tender process and, and ultimately measured in terms of, of its price for, to the consumer. I mean, South Africa's advantages for, for nuclear are that, you know, it, South Africa is geographically stable. Um, we've, we've had nuclear in this country for the last 40 years. Um, it's, it's a very, very low uh, carbon footprint. Um, and it has very low water use if it's situated next to the sea. So we've got experience in nuclear and, you know, I, I, I don't think it's a short term option, um, not for the next 10 to 15 years at least, but I think we should at least have the discussion about it. Yeah, I think before I mean, Chris yeah. comes in here, I mean, can we trust Eskom to build a nuclear plant when you've seen the shoddy building at Modipi and Kusile and the resultant explosion? I mean, can we actually afford to have an explosion? Because that's a bigger impact on humans, mm -hmm. on animals, and the environment as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. We cannot rely on ESCOM to build an, uh, another nuclear plant. This this has has to be a public-private partnership. Um, and again, we've got great track record with that in the renewable space. Uh, we've done it before, and working together, you know, it, <laughs> I believe it is an option that, that we could be considering. Yeah. I think Chris, Chris, do you want to maybe jump in? Because I know you've got a difference of opinion. Yeah, look, my view is not that different from, from Paul, actually, uh, when you get down to it. Uh, first of all, I agree with Paul. We should not be writing off technology. We should not have a closed mind. We need to keep our minds open to the possibility of new developments. But let us just look at where things stand right now, today. Uh, what we do know is that uh, today, nuclear is the most expensive uh, generation technology. It has very high capital costs. And over the uh, levelized costs of electricity, over the lifetime of the plant, it comes in at the highest. Uh, but there are other serious issues that need to, to be considered. First of all, as things stand at the moment, uh, small modular reactors are not available yet. They're not commercially available. We don't know what the price is. Nobody knows what the price is because they haven't been built and deployed commercially uh, for, for commercial production of electricity inland. Um, so we don't know what the price is, but I believe the strategy there should be watch and wait. Let us see what develops over the next 10, 15 years, and maybe something comes out that is uh, useful. Uh, but in terms of the existing technologies, large pressurized water reactors, these are large, lumpy procurements. Uh, they take at least five years to do the regulatory preparation and at least 10 years to actually construct. Uh, so we're not talking about this as a short term solution, uh, maybe 15 years plus. Uh, but most important uh, in my mind is that they, they, they require a 100 year commitment to a single vendor country, to a single vendor company, a single vendor technology, uh, and a single reactor design. Uh, because it takes 15 years to construct, uh, they operate for 75 to 80 years, and it takes another 15 years to decommission. And I, I just ask people the question, if you had to buy a cell phone, a Nokia brick now, let's say, well, 15 years ago, that you knew you had to keep for, for 50 years, would that be the right technology choice to buy a phone that has got a life and a commitment to that technology and that particular design for 50 years? No, of course not. Because within 10 years, it's obsolete. The point is exactly the same when it comes to energy. We're undergoing a revolution in energy technologies right now. Things are changing faster than they ever have changed before. And to lock oneself in to a hundred year commitment to a nuclear energy with one vendor country is strategically wrong. It makes no business sense and banks will not finance it. They will not finance projects that have a hundred year uh, commitment. Uh, so uh, I think if you look at it in the cold uh, light of day uh, and, and the hard facts, uh, it's not a solution for the next 15 years in South Africa. And in 15 years, who knows what we're going to have at our disposal. But may I say, let us not close our mind 
to new technologies uh, because uh, they, they, they can do things that surprise us. And we've seen that in the last uh, 50 years. But certainly from my point of view, nuclear is, is, a, is, is a watch and wait strategy. Thanks, Chris. Paul, I think for me, another question is really the fact that the global energy utilities and systems are really moving more towards a decentralized, flexible model, you know, where you find pockets of generation all over the country. Um, South Africa seems to be moving backwards in considering a nuclear because that's now more a massive old structure, quite centralized and supplying power to the rest of the country. Do you have any comments on that? Masiabi, my starting point is that we need more baseload energy in, in our country. Um, I, I agree with you that it needs to be distributed around the country. And, you know, I think any consideration of, of nuclear um, or, or green hydrogen, for that matter, you know, needs to be considered on that basis. Smaller plants, um, I, you know, I take note of what Chris has said about the modular reactors. Um, but you know, in due course, maybe that's something we can consider. Smaller modular reactors that are spread around the coastline of, of South Africa, um, small size, and again, in a, in a public-private partnership model. Tell me more about future growth approach, you know, um, what is the necessary criteria for assessing investments in the, in the above? So, you know, gas is a, a technology that we've uh, been considering lately. And, you know, m much of what was said earlier, you know, we, we agree that it is a transition technology um, in order to bridge the gap between coal and, and, and renewables and, and other technologies that, that will come on stream. What we are very cautious about at Future Growth is ensuring that gas does not become a, a fixed um, asset in, in our country, which cannot be used for anything else, because, you know, there, there is a real risk of it being becoming a stranded asset. You know, gas, gas potentially could become a, a stranded technology. So it needs to provide that top up. Um, it needs to balance the grid in the, in the short term, but be available to convert uh, into uh, facilitating green hydrogen. And, and that really, that's the, the that's the longer term solution for for, for South Africa. Um, we we look very closely at the track record of developers. They they need to have experience and they need to have proven themselves. Uh, there needs to be alignment of interests with them. You know, they they need to have their own capital invested. Um, but South Africa is in a great position for. For, for development of, of new technologies. And um, we're excited. We, we see many opportunities for South Africa's economy to grow through, through the development space um, of, of, of new technology. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. I mean, that leads in nicely to the question to Bongile to say, what are South Africa's competitive advantages and opportunities in the energy sector, Bongile, especially when you look at natural resources? Well, we know that um, South Africa is one of the most resource-rich climates in the country for generating renewable energy. Um, we have one of the best solar irradiation sites and among the best wind sites along the coastal lines of the western and eastern cape of the country. Um, we know that in as, in, in as far as, yes, the resource, the, the renewable energy resource of wind and solar is free, there is, you know, a marginal cost, a, a low marginal cost attached to transferring that energy into electricity that you and I can use. Um, we also know that there's low seasonality in the wind condition, conditions and uh, solar irradiation uh, in the country compared to the rest of the world, which now speaks to the integration of this energy uh, being easier and, and presenting an opportunity to introduce a large amount of variable renewables into the electricity system in a far more cost effective way. Um, beyond the conducive uh, solar and wind resources, the country has also one of the largest high-grade mineral resources like vanadium, manganese, nickel, copper, and cobalt, which are used in global energy storage system. And, and, and these could create, you know, an opportunity for new industry 
and, and, and localization in the country. Mm. Paul, what about the national electricity grid and, and infrastructure? So that's definitely a, a competitive advantage for South Africa. We've got a, a really well-established uh, infrastructure base in our, in our country. We've got roads and rail and transport and ports. Um, and that's all critical for developing new technology and, and um, bringing technology into far-flung far areas of, of the country. Um, you've mentioned the, the national grid, the electricity grid. I mean, that, that's also a, a really valuable asset that, that we have as a country. Um, it, it needs to be upgraded, so there, there is capital to be spent on it. But nonetheless, it is an established uh, asset which will facilitate the connection of a lot of new energy uh, in, in, into the grid in, in years to come. Um, so, so those are both huge advantages for, for our country. I mean, the, the, the next, the, the opportunity for South Africa um, is really its ability to attract fixed investment. Um, you know, the, the economy of South Africa the last 30 years has, has become more and more service orientated. Um, and that has incurred a lot more debt for the fiscus. And it's at the end of the day, you know, the growth prospects of the country have, have, have declined a lot. We need to reindustrialize uh, our economy and by bringing fixed investment into our country by supporting developers and, and, and production of, of equipment and, and technology, we'll ensure that this reindustrialization of our economy gets, gets traction. And, and that's going to bring the economic growth that we so desperately need. Mm. Chris, what about international green finance for power reform or carbon reduction in South Africa? Yeah, this is something that is really interesting and is happening right now. I mean, we've seen uh, last week or the last two weeks, five emissaries uh, from uh, the United States, France, Germany, um, the UK and the European Union all coming to South Africa to talk about green finance. And uh, it's so interesting to me because this is one of our competitive advantages. Paradoxically, our current heavy over-dependence on coal is a competitive advantage for us in attracting green finance because we have something that the world actually wants. We have a carbon footprint that is relatively cheaper to decarbonize. So uh, the cost of decarbonization in South Africa with its 80% or 75% uh, dependence on coal-fired power is a serious low-hanging fruit. And the cost of decarbonizing our energy sector in South Africa, our electricity sector, is simply a, a fraction of the cost of decarbonizing in Europe because there the low-hanging fruits have somewhat been picked already. So South Africa is a very attractive destination it can be used to serve as an example for other high carbon intensity countries. Uh, and if it can be made a success of and shown to be made a success of, uh, it opens the door to uh, similar approaches taken in other countries that are heavily dependent on coal, uh, for example, uh, Indonesia or India. So we've got something that the world wants, uh, that they are prepared to give us uh, uh, finance at concessional rates, even grant finance. And uh, the question is uh, uh, to sit around the table and negotiate and make sure that South Africa gets uh, something that it needs, capital, uh, to uh, help uh, this transition to a lower carbon future uh, at uh, preferential rates and something that the world needs uh, or that the developed countries need, and that is uh, a good bang for their buck when it comes to spending money to uh, on decarbonization for, for climate change. So uh, this process is ongoing now as we speak. Uh, the negotiations are in full swing. I think we've got to be careful in South Africa. Yes, we want the money, but there are people who feel who really do not like taking advice from industrialized countries um, and, and it, it sticks in their throat um, uh, to negotiate uh, with them on these matters. Uh, there are many people that feel that the developed world actually owes us. Uh, but, you know, my view is 
that if you want these deals to be done, it's not about charity. It's about making sure that both parties come out as winners. And so we need to look for these win-win situa situations. And I think it can be done. And I think we can get a, a, a preferential finance, which will help us on our decarbonization path. And uh, the developed countries will get what they need. In other words, a good bang for their buck for decarbonization. Win-win, that's what makes a deal. Absolutely, Chris. Let's talk about just transition. What is just transition, Paul? Just transition is the fair and inclusive process to, to include all, all stakeholders in, in, in the energy sector transition. Um, and, you know, we, we talk about it really in relation to coal workers and communities that, that rely on the, the coal technology that's, that's in their areas. Now, you know, we've, we've been talking a lot about new technologies today, and um, we, we can't forget that by bringing on new technologies, we need to bring along the people that have vested interests in, in the energy sector, um, and in particular, the coal sector. They need to participate in the growth of, of, of the sector. Um, you know, people have vested interests. You know, these are plants we're talking about, um, and we need to be sensitive to that. But South Africa's energy sector has to transform. It has to move forward. Um, and, and, you know, luckily, you know, this transition is going to take, you know, 30 years plus, you know, coal stations are not just going to close down tomorrow. There is a plan to, to, to roll them off over the next 20 to 30 years. Um, and we've got time, we've got space to uh, prepare for this transition and ensure that we bring people along with us that will be affected by by the closure of these of these coal stations. Thanks. Bongile, you know, how can the energy reform support a just and equitable transition for energy workers and communities? So firstly, Ms. Yabi, we can localize, you know, um, equipment supply, you know. So there is an opportunity with, with the renewable energy program for solar, uh, wind and battery um, owner equipment manufacturers who are already supplying um, um, these these components into the renewable energy industry. So, firstly, if we are going to see a consistent rollout of the renewable energy program pipeline, then there is a, a an opportunity to source, you know, silicon aluminium used in solar PV plants from from local supply chains and an, an opportunity to, to to manufacture these components locally. Um, this also again presents an opportunity, you know, to set up more wind tower blade manufacturing facilities and facilities to assemble these these, these wind power components. S secondly, um, localization and the drive for green industries shouldn't be a government only driven uh, initiative, but should also be driven by de demand in the in the energy energy market. Now, I'm of the view that this could be spurred on by government's actual delivery on on its com commitment to de decentralize the energy sector and increase energy procurement from from uh, private private producers all of this in a nutshell could then could then mean that we you know we create more jobs locally we both the local industries and we grow our tax base uh, while whilst doing that yes thanks bangela all this sounds good but paul has this not been tried before in the emergency round though Yes, there was a, a big drive for local procurement in the emergency round. Um, unfortunately, you know, there wasn't enough planning behind this emergency round to enable local manufacturers to, to get ready to, to produce local equipment. And, you know, when the bids were announced earlier this year, there was a scrambling amongst developers who, who, who weren't sure whether they were going to win their bids, but suddenly they had to procure local equipment. And unfortunately, you know, it takes time and it takes planning to ramp up local production. And, you know, we were doing that very, very well between 2010 and 2015. There was a lot of new industry opening up to support renewables. Um, but with the stalling, I mean, many of those local manufacturers uh, went into liquidation. And now the, the ones remaining need to build up 
capacity again. And this is where it's so critical that we have certainty of policy, we have predictability, and we have a constant rollout of, of new energy coming in so that the value chain can prepare um, for to, to, to supply the, the energy sector. May I come in here, Mati Abe? Yes, um, I, I agree everything with uh, what has been said uh, by Paul and Bongile. Uh, I just want to add uh, uh, one or two further comments uh, that I personally think that the mistake that is being made by the DTIC is uh, to have this localization essentially to be project driven. And for me, this is a mistake. Uh, localization needs more than just one project. Uh, it needs more than just a series of projects. It needs to be demand driven and not project driven. And that means it takes time to develop and can, cannot just be switched on and off on a project by project basis. So yes, Paul, I agree. We need consistency. We need long term uh, planning. But ultimately, uh, it needs to be demand driven and not just mm -hmm. South African demand driven. It needs to be competitive on the world market. It, if, it is, uh, if, if it is coming in at a significant premium in South Africa, it means it will never be exported outside of South Africa. And we need to look for opportunities for which we have a competitive advantage, not only in South Africa, but on the global markets. That is what will lead, I believe, to a sustainable localization. And this idea of, of localization by government decree in a tender, thou shalt have 20% local content in a panel manufactured in Durban, you know, whatever. Uh, for me, that's the wrong approach. That is, that is uh, localization by decree and I'm afraid that people sitting behind desks in government uh, don't quite, uh, you, you know, are not quite in touch with the real world, uh, the real industrial world, which are looking for uh, a sustainability long past a single project. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, what about repurposing of the existing coal fire stations to new technologies, Paul? Um, could we do this and how do we go about doing this? So this, this is already on the cards. Um, I mean, ESCOM is, is, is planning to repurpose their, their coal stations. And in fact, Komati is one of the first um, that's currently in planning phase, uh, whereby uh, solar PV panels are going to be installed on this old decommissioned station. Um, and there's opportunity to do uh, green hydrogen and, and gas and so on. Um, I mean, we, we, we do envisage that, you know, again, given the infrastructure that's in place, that it can be used. Um, you know, we've, um, in, you know, it, it, it's also a pathway to ensuring that local communities stay vested in, 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 in the operation of those uh, plants. Um, and it, it certainly can be done. Okay. Okay, then, I mean, if we look at investors, how do we ensure that investors hold us accountable in terms of ensuring that the transition is just? So I, I think the key is to, to measure this transition. I mean, we can talk a lot about it, but without it being quantifiable, um, you know, we, we, we just, it's all um, hypothetical, really. Um, and I mean, Future Growth has done a lot of work in understanding and measuring um, ESG, environmental, social and governance principles in projects that we've invested in to date. Um, and looking forward, I mean, we, we, we are measuring the amount of, of job creation that, that projects uh, make, you know, the amount of local procurement and, and investment in local communities. Um, that is a critical part of our investment philosophy and you know, how, we, how we differentiate between projects. Does anybody else want to comment on this, Bongile? 
Yeah, without, I mean, repeating what Paul has said, I think investors have an opportunity, you know, to set prerequisites to, to their funding and make it clear that, as uh, you know, that they will only support projects that obviously are furthering or enabling the, 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 the just transition. And I mean, as Paul has mentioned, these projects would then be projects that contribute to various developmental objectives like job creation, social upliftment, and economic transformation. And participation, meaning economic transformation, meaning participation by the broader, broader group and demographic in the country. Um, now, again, my view, mm -hmm. investors can also think about how to best subsidize this to ensure that they encourage the just transition, either through preferential rates or rate discounts. In, in either form, investors have a role to play in ensuring that they encourage the, 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 the just transition. Can I say uh, also, Masi Abi? Sorry to interrupt you, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, again, I, I just want to put a, a, another view on the table uh, regarding socio-economic development. Uh, and there is this debate that takes place uh, in the energy sector and in the renewable energy sector. Uh, we see that in government-led uh, projects, there are uh, uh, obligations upon the developer to do certain socio-economic developments, building schools, clinics, uh, community work, roads, etc., etc., and uh, it's great, uh, but uh, it comes at a cost, and it comes at the cost of increased uh, uh, tariffs. Uh, but the question that people ask is: Is this the most efficient way to develop? Uh, maybe it is the most efficient way of develop, but I can just point out that in countries like the Middle East. They do not burden developers with these kind of socio-economic objectives. That is done by a different arm of government. And they think that it's more efficient, uh, you know, for people that are specialists in socio-economic development to work on it and to leave renewable energy developers to work on renewable energy. And frankly, they know nothing about building schools and clinics and things like this. Uh, they subcontract them out. They get somebody else to do it. Uh, and the question is, is that the best way of doing it? In South Africa, it may be the best way if there are no other government agencies that can full, fulfill that role effectively and efficiently. But in some countries, they leave developers of renewable energy to develop renewable energy at least cost, focus on getting the cost of electricity down, and other agencies uh, focus on the socio-economic development because that's what they know best and not to try and mix the two together. But I must concede that in the South African context, it is perhaps if we do not have government agencies that have this capability, maybe it's best that the developers do it after all. But it comes at a price, a, a higher tariff bid uh, and a higher tariff rate for the next 20 years. Uh, and that we have to bear in mind. Thank you, Chris, for that insight. Then the last question before we close, I mean, how does future growth respond? You know, what are our capabilities and what is the value proposition that we have for our investors? Paul. Masiabi, future growth can invest up and down the value chain in the energy sector. We, we're not restricted to just the IPP projects and, uh, you know, at a senior debt level, we can invest across the, the credit curve. We've got flexibility. And, you know, that's also really key in supporting this just transition, um, that we can support the smaller manufacturers and, and developers. Um, we, as I mentioned earlier, we've got an embedded process as well to measure investments in terms of their contribution to social and environmental and governance aspects. Um, and we've got a long track record of investing in uh, infrastructure. Um, you know, many years, 20 plus years, and we've invested um, over 10 billion of, of capital into the renewable energy program over the last 10 years. Yeah. Bangili, I don't know, would you like to add anything to that um, before we close? I think just talking to track record of investments to date, I mean, future growth through the 10 billion rand power that fund has invested across 33 renewable energy projects. Um, across different technologies um, and across different uh, bid windows of the reprogram of the renewable energy program. Um, you know, Future Growth also has a group of investment professionals who, who possess the right skills, experience and exp 
expertise to ensure that client money is deployed to the correct projects um, under the respective fund mandates in order to deliver client returns. Yeah. Thanks for that, Bongile. Before we close, could I just please give each of you one minute just as a closing sentence for the conversation that we had today in terms of it's power, an opportunity, or a curse? Well, maybe I come in here first. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, I, I do see enormous opportunity here, uh, but we have to get moving. In the public procurement space, we need to sort out this IRP and fast. It doesn't take, it should not take two years to sort out an IRP. It can be done in three months. There are people like the CSR that will produce an IRP, a credible IRP for you properly done in three months. Uh, let's get on with that. Uh, we need to start uh, speeding up the public procurement space uh, because uh, we need to fill these gaps and fast. Uh, and then we need to bring in the private sector uh, through self-generation, distributed generation, embedded generation, taking advantage of this 100 megawatt uh, raising of the threshold. Uh, and, and we need to remove the obstacles, remove the red tape and let the private sector become part of the solution uh, to the energy supply and needs of South Africa. Thank you, Chris. Paul, do you want to go next? Now, Ms. Yabi, South Africa is at a, at a tipping point, really, in terms of its energy sector. Um, there is increasing demand. There's also a lot of potential supply that is going to come on stream. As, as Chris has, has said, you know, it needs to be, the sector needs to be opened up and, and we believe it will be. Um, and we're going to see a lot of new investment coming in. You know, South Africa in many ways is in a pioneering phase. Um, you know, we, we've got these opportunities to develop a lot of new technology. Um, we've got a proven track record already of having been able to do public-private partnership. And um, we can become a global leader again. You know, we were, uh, you know, t 10 years ago in terms of bringing on new renewables, we can resurrect that. We can do a lot more. Um, there's certainly a lot of capital waiting to do that. We need government to, to, to open up the sector and, and allow investors to come in. Thank you, Paul. Wangile? I think, Masiebi, on a lighter note, you know, there's an opportunity for all of us to leave a different legacy. Um, as South Africa's slogan says, we are life with possibility. There's a lot of potential that we can uh, uh, dig into and, 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 and use and utilize to ensure that we leave a cleaner environment. Thank you, Bongile. Thank you, panelists. It was really lovely being with you today. And I hope that everybody who's out there has received some insightful information. We will now move on to the second part of our session. Those who need to leave, please feel free to do so. The recording will be available, but please, if you've got time, we are now going to jump into the questions and answer session and we'll make sure that we cover all of them. So if you've got the time, please just spend time with us. And I think Andrew Cantor is going to join us now as we go through the questions. We'll also give him an opportunity to perhaps answer some of those questions from um, a CIO perspective. So um, just jumping onto the questions, number one is, should we not be moving from large scale energy production to small scale production? So per home or complex, et cetera. I certainly think we should. Um, and, you know, we, we, we're waiting for this 100 megawatt self-generation uh, to, to really open up and it, it, it will be. Um, and we're going to see a lot more private producers of, of power coming, coming on stream. Okay. Next question is, what about geothermal energy? Have there been any viability studies regarding this? Would this not be as much cleaner form of energy than anything thus far? Yeah, if I may come in here, uh, there is, as you know, literally no geothermal generation uh, in, in South Africa. And it is not on the planning horizon. If you look at the IRP, and it never has been on the planning horizon. Now, I'm not a geological expert, but that kind of tells me that our resources in this regard in South Africa uh, are not significant. 
Um, certainly other countries in Africa and around the world uh, do exploit this technology, but I think the geological conditions have to be right. And there doesn't seem to be any sign that in South Africa the geological conditions are right. Certainly it's not on the planning horizon at all. Thank you for that, Chris. The next question says, what do we do about Gwede and the government? I'm going to Chris, duck that do you one. Want to take question? <laughs> okay, look, can I just say, I think Gwede Matasha is sometimes a misunderstood man. Um, look, he's very blunt. And sometimes what he says gets him into trouble. But I think if we listen carefully to his words, uh, he says, uh, he, he does, I think, acknowledge that there is a need for an energy transition. What he's worried about is swinging the pendulum from one side to the other too quickly. And therefore, I think he is aware of the need for a transition, uh, certainly coming from the coal sector himself. Uh, obviously, uh, it, it's, it's a complex uh, a political space. Uh, and I do think to some extent, uh, the messages uh, that he gives or the, the words that are coming from him appear to be somewhat out of line with his cabinet colleagues at this time. Uh, but on the other hand, I don't think we should demonize him uh, to, to the extent that he is being demonized at the moment. I, I think he does express some valid concerns that need to be thought about carefully. Uh, and I sometimes think people put words into his mouth. But if you listen to him carefully about the energy transition, I think he does acknowledge the, the need for a transition. But as I say, his bluntness, especially in the face of uh, people coming bearing gifts, <laughs> uh, you know, from these emissaries abroad. Uh, but I think he does also have, uh, have reason to be a little suspicious sometimes about people bearing gifts. But a, a fascinating character, part of South Africa, part of our history and part of our political environment. But I do think also that the job of being the chairperson of the ANC uh, together with the Minister of Minerals, together with the Minister of Energy, is probably a bit more than, than anybody could handle. Um, and I think that they should perhaps split the three positions into three different people. Um, I do think we need a, a Minister of Energy that is really close to the energy sector and uh, have a very good understanding of it. I'm not saying that he doesn't, uh, but he doesn't come from a tech background. I know that politicians form a different role as a minister, they are the political interface. Uh, but I do think there is a need in South Africa to have more expertise, technic technocratic expertise, you know, in a critical ministry like energy. Andrew, maybe this question for can you. Can I just say as well, okay. sorry, sorry, Masia, but can I just say as well, you know, I, I would wish that Gwede Mantashi wouldn't talk about clean coal. Um, <laughs> You know, it's it's a mixed message, you know, relative to what the country is trying to say, and you know he's going against the flow. Clean coal is a fallacy, and it you know coal will not be funded in this country. Um, it's what we've spoken about in this webinar today. Thanks for that, Paul. Andrew, any large scale investment in energy technology should be seen in the energy technology of tomorrow. Investing in more of the same seems a step backward. Not so. Uh, I don't think so. I mean, I thought I thought it was really interesting. Um, Chris's comments about nuclear, about it being a hundred year commitment. I mean, nuclear plants, you could finance them on a 30 or 40 year expected life and cash flow stream. They might last more. I mean, they might last another 10, 20, 30 years beyond that with, with re refurbishment or what have you. But I don't see it as materially different from coal fired plants from a commitment point of view. And we can argue about, about whether nuclear it will be the technology of the future or whether it can improve. It probably will improve. But as we sit here today, the coal plants we have are the cheapest to refurb a coal plant than it is to build new technology today. Now, that's not good because we don't want to do carbon emissions. So, is there going to be improvements? Future, absolutely, but does that throw out nuclear today? I don't think so. I think I think it's a I think it's a false argument. Um, and, and so these things transition over decades and decades. But we, what we don't want to do is make a mistake of investing in 
more coal today. Well, you know you're burning carbon or, or the gas infrastructure that Paul, Paul and Chris have both mentioned. You don't want to invest in that infrastructure because even it won't be a stranded asset. It'll be a least cost asset. We'll still be using this gas infrastructure in 1,500 years that we never wanted to build in the first place. So, so I think there's this idea of the no regret options of, of low carbon, relatively low cost, and you have to make your choice of what's available today. And in any case, where we sit today is the power is going out today. We don't have the luxury of normal power planning of 20, 20 years to get these things settled settled in. Um, uh, just one additional point on the geothermal. The, the, uh, we, we, we don't have, a, you need volcanic vents. You need where tectonic plates meet, where you get volcanic vents to get really good geothermal. Go to Iceland if you want to see that. But you do not want to build a nuclear power plant there. So South Africa's geological advantage for nuclear versus geothermal is that we are geologically stable. You know, the earthquakes are rare and small. Thank you, Andrew. Another question here. Given South Africa's 3,000 kilometer coastline, why is nothing being done to develop new alternative wave or tidal generation capacity? Yeah, on the, on the technology side, uh, uh, wave technology is, there is work being done on it around the world. Uh, there are already tidal systems using estuaries. Uh, these are not large scale, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, wave energy, um, it, tremendous technical issues regarding, uh, uh, you know, corrosion and mechanical engineering in the sea. Uh, this is not something that's going to lead to least cost energy. Um, when there are other options available, like wind and solar and battery storage, etc. Again, the uh, bottom line is that it's not on South Africa's planning horizon. Uh, there is academic research work being done at some of the universities, some little pilot projects here and there, uh, but it's not a mainstream solution and is not seen to be a, main solu a mainstream solution, certainly for the next 15 years. Uh, and that's why it's not on our planning horizon. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a mistake. It hasn't just been forgotten, I'm sure of that. So, so you take a you take a lot of you take a lot of kit and you throw it into the salt water. Why would you do that? You would do that if you've got incredibly expensive real estate, highly populated areas, and no alternatives. We have a gazillion, I'm exaggerating, uh, kilometers, square kilometers of 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 arid, dry, sparsely populated, sun irradiated landmass. We don't need to throw expensive kit in the ocean to produce energy. I mean, that's that's the short headline. It's pure economics. We just don't need to do it. Maybe in East Coast US, where they've got highly dense populations and expensive real estate, they should think about that. We we don't really need to think about that. Let's just put some solar panels in the field and, and let them make power. Yeah, I, I quite agree. And, and, and I think our, our options for producing green hydrogen as a long term option, we've got good solar and wind, we've got cheap land, uh, uh, you know, we've got uh, technology in terms of the Sassel Fisher Trops process uh, to produce green power fuels. Uh, it gives us these competitive advantages that you do need to be competitive both south locally and, and internationally on export markets. So I think the opportunities for massive uh, rollout of uh, wind and uh, solar and the production of green hydrogen are far more real uh, than a wave power from the sea. Thanks, Chris. Chris, I've got a question for you here. It says, if South Africa were to create jobs and generally transform our economy, we need to reverse the trends towards minimizing government role. Please comment on this. Uh, yeah, in my view, government doesn't create jobs. Uh, the private sector creates jobs. Uh, government has a role, I'm sure, uh, of creating the right environment, the regulatory framework, uh, possibly public-private partnerships. Uh, but I think a government's record is not good uh, in terms of, um, uh, you know, massive job creation in South Africa. Uh, the renewable energy sector and the just energy transition, I believe, has opportunities for very, very significant job creation. Uh, and uh, I think this is the way Eskim is thinking. If you look at what Eskim are talking about in the uh, repurposing of its power stations, Eskim is not talking about doing this themselves. They're not even talking about owning these things themselves. They are talking about having a minority stake in them and bringing quasi equity to the table, not in cash because they got no cash. What they're talking about is bringing 
equity in kind. In other words, land, uh, grid connections, um, an existing uh, site license, uh, and they can bring these things to speed up the process. And that has significant value. It has value to other partners who are going to be in control and also bring finance and bring the money to the table. So um, I, I see that, that this uh, transition has a lot of opportunities just in like the Kamati power station pilot that they're talking about. You know, there's the whole agri economy uh, that could come along with uh, solar PV farms and agricultural processes in the wake of this underneath the solar uh, panels. Uh, the job creation opportunities on an ongoing basis in agri processes and, and, and food production and, and farming uh, in formerly uh, devastated landscapes, uh, the opportunities for job creation are enormous. In the rooftop solar PV business, the jobs that can be created in designing, installing, uh, operating, maintaining, uh, a, a small and medium sized rooftop solar PV, the job intensity there is much higher per kilowatt of power generated than in a nuclear power station, uh, which employs very few people. Uh, and, and the same uh, with a solar PV farm, a hundred megawatt farm, relatively speaking, it's quite a small number of people that, uh, but if you, if you spin off uh, the water aspects uh, of, of cleaning water, of uh, agri processing, and food and, 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 and agriculture uh, in these formerly devastated areas, I think the job creation potential is truly enormous. Thank you, Chris. And another question, maybe Paul or Bongile, you'd like to answer. If power usage moves from ESCOM or the national grid, what are the implications for cross subsidization of the poor, particularly at the municipal level? I think, Masyabi, we, we, we need to consider that, you know, not all of the users of ESCOM will be moving away from the grid, right? Now, if we talk about the the power or, or the revenues that ESCOM will lose by, you know, your large industrial players or your mining companies moving away from the grid, one needs to consider then that the demand for that power will not be there. And in a sense, ESCOM will not have to resort to there will be cost savings in a way because ESCOM will not have to resort to now having to use their peaking diesel generating plants, which are expensive, to sort of try and meet that demand. What that, what that means now for the consumer is that there's more of electricity to go around. Um, going back to the fact that not all of ESCOM's consumers will be moving away from the grid, one needs to think about the fact that to go off grid is particularly expensive. Um, especially in a, in a country like South Africa. So only if a small few of residents or private users will, will, will have the luxury of affording going off grid. Um, if I now merge the two points that I've made, yes, ESCOM will lose uh, our revenues from those uh, large industrial players that will be going off grid. However, um, these will then result also in cost savings from a, from from an op opex point of view because ESCOM will no longer now need to be utilizing the, uh, their get, uh, diesel peakers to to sort of try and meet that demand. Um, the larger consumer, the, the 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 ordinary layman on the street will have access to power, and um, they will not be you know in a way moving away from ESCOM's uh, ESCOM's uh, supply. I think, right. can I just add something? So think, think about telephone technology. Uh, 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you built a house, got an apartment, you put in a copper line from telecom. Now you take a house or, 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 a, um, or an apartment, you don't bother, we're all on cell phones. The po power is going that way. As we sit today, the Cape Town tariff is, starts at two rand 70 and goes up from there. We've heard already that solar plus battery, you can come in at one rand sixty five. Now that's industrial scale or utility scale, but let's assume that a retail consumer with capital can do it now cheaply on their own house. The evolution of the power industry is going to be enormous. It's part of the problem we have in the country because there's a giant Eskom, which is this legacy asset that's in wind down 
But we all want to have that backup power when the sun doesn't shine or our batteries aren't strong enough. You want to have a backup battery, which we call the grid. That's that's the challenge is how much does it cost that grid? Who do we how do we pay to maintain that grid? Um, and do we pay you a, 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 an availability charge plus a kilowatt per hour? charge? Nobody's got the answer to this yet. But the clear evolution, the clear evolution of the power in the future is mini grids, micro grids, off grids, uh, distributed grids. And, and that's part of the challenge for the country is instead of thinking and the answer to the question was, should we be moving away from centralization to decentralization? And I think it's going to happen. Pure economics will push it that way. And the subsidy for the poor and how you work that into for those that don't have the capital, frankly, or the homes that, that they could be financed against, how you subsidize those consumers so they don't carry the highest marginal cost. Yeah. One thing I think yeah. we should be looking at is how to use the grid more effectively and to leverage this asset in a way that is not being leveraged at the moment. Uh, one of the way of this doing this is to facilitate wheeling across the grid uh, where the grid operators can earn a fee uh, from people who want to use the grid as a transport mechanism for wheeling power from one from a generator to a customer and taking that to the next level of course is the whole question of trading of electricity where, where one can use uh, the grid as the transport mechanism from multiple generators to literally thousands of customers uh, by creating a trading platform uh, that can look at uh, a market clearing in one hour intervals or half hour intervals. Uh, and, and this is very real, but this now starts extracting the real value of an existing asset that is actually performing quite well. Technically, yes, more investment is required, uh, but our grid covers the whole country, very different from other countries of Africa. This is a valuable asset uh, that we need to invest in and we need to leverage using new ideas uh, of wheeling and trading uh, and, and turn this asset into something really valuable. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think that answers right. one it of the an, questions. This because... national grid is a national asset. You look at what happened in Texas last week, last winter. Oh, no, but there's always going to be spot available, a spot price of electricity. And what happened? Co supply collapse, price went up, people were freezing or going broke. Same as what's happening in Europe now. You just you break up the grid too much. You break up the centralized support structure, and and you could put yourself in a serious crisis. So I hate to admit it, but there is a place for a central, a central authority, a central distribution system. Sorry, Marcia. Excellent. No, that's great because you answered the the question that was actually asked to say what is the reality of grid capacity after round five, and how will this shape the bidding in round six and seven. And, and the thing was, can we trust ESCOM to bring on new grid capacity? So I would say you touched on all those elements, if I'm correct, in terms of your answers. Or would you like to add on to I, 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 I did not. I, I think somebody should address the issue of grid capacity for the additional rounds, because that has been a stumbling block for previous bidding rounds. I don't know, Chris or Paul, do you have a view? Yeah, Chris, yeah, Paul, you, you come in here. Oh. Okay, yeah, I, I, I think it is a, a real constraint, um, potentially for round five and, and onwards. I mean, ESCOM has recognized that this is a constraint, and I understand that it's part of ESCOM's budgeting um, in terms of trying to access this concessional finance um, that will be partly used to uh, invest in the grid. Um, but it certainly is front and center, we understand, of, of ESCOM's mind at the moment. Yeah, if I may also come in here, uh, Masiabi, um, there's no question about it uh, that the grid is becoming a constraint and requires greater investment. Uh, but a big part of the problem, I think, is the way we are procuring uh, renewable power through the REAP program, which was uh, the actual methodology was set up 10 years ago when grid access was not a problem, uh, when we had a low penetration, and we still, by the way, have relatively low penetration compared to other countries. What I see as going forward as a future is we need to start looking at procurements for renewable energy centered around these renewable energy development zones, rather than a national procurement where everybody is fighting for the very, very best uh, solar irradiation and wind, uh, uh, which are in certain geographic areas, we need to spread this out across the country. There are grid access. Yes, the irradiation may be slightly worse there, but you avoid transmission losses. Uh, you avoid time uh, uh, delays. 
you enable quicker access and time is money. So by spreading this out around the country in regional procurements, as opposed to a national procurement where we're all fighting over a limited number of grid access points, is not the way to go. We are now 10 years later, and we're using the same procurement methodology by looking at the lowest price at the point of delivery, instead of looking at the lowest price at the point of consumption. So we need to start looking at this with a spatial uh, aspect and not simply uh, a least cost aspect, uh, because least cost is, uh, it, it can be dependent on the point of delivery. And it's what we really want is the least cost at the point of consumption. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, how have funding costs been for cleaner energy? Is there a funding cost benefit for cleaner energy? It's a good question. Um, I mean, we we consider, you know, new investments on their merits. Um, we, we look at the economic side of it. We also look at the, the social and governance side, as, as I mentioned earlier. I mean, that's part of our investment process. But, you know, we, 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 we don't subsidize returns on, on clean energy. Um, so, we, we, you know, and, and we believe that, you know, clean energy should be able to support commercial returns. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think that's the problem here. Um, you know, the, the real issue is creating the opportunity and, you know, the policy to support um, clean energy. It, it's, not, it's not the funding. And I mean, as, as the scale of clean energy grows, I mean, the, the unfixed costs are going to re reduce even more. So, you know, I don't think it's the, the funding costs that, that are holding it back. Just to add to that, I agree, agree with Paul, we don't subsidize returns, except to say that if you're trying to fund, I don't know, a gas power ship, for example, there's going to be a much narrower universe of people willing to fund that at all, which means your cost of capital is going to be higher. And that's how we, that's how responsible investing should work, is that those companies that have weak ESG factors or we could, you know, particularly in this case, a weak environmental factor will have a, a more narrow universe of funders. And they, they, then de facto, they will pay a higher marginal cost of capital, whereas there's a lot more money pouring into green energy. It's not that we're trying to finance it, but there's more competition to make the funding. So the rates will be relatively tighter. Okay. Another question. Coal has become highly politicized. Are we not being short sighted in ending coal power generation when we do not have a viable watt per watt alternative? Well, I do think we do have a viable what to what alternative. Uh, and I think uh, the cost of coal is going to get more expensive as carbon taxes go up. Uh, already, you know, uh, today the, the price of coal is at very high levels. Uh, we have got a fleet of aging power stations. Uh, do we extend their life uh, or, or, or at, at our peril? Or do we decommission them and look at these viable commercially viable alternative solutions that are available today. And, and I think uh, that's the point that the questioner uh, is not on the same page as, as, as us. Uh, I think there are uh, viable uh, technical and uh, economical and financial solutions available today. How do we stop can, Russia? Can or just, uh, oh, sorry. That, that coal, coal is still going to be around for a while. Um, sure. You know, it's it's currently contributing around 80 to 85 percent of our energy, but over the next 10 years, that's expected to go down to about 60 percent of of our energy contribution. So, you know, coal is going to be around probably until 2050. Um, you know, in terms of what's planned, but just on a much smaller scale and progressively getting smaller. Thanks, Marcia. Thank you. How do we stop Russia or Turkey, et cetera, coming in and financing more dirty power with dire long-term consequences? Government thinks short-term gains. It needs to stop. Look, that question is freighted with all sorts of assumptions, with <laughs> some of which we also fear. I mean, Paul mentioned earlier, we'd love to be having the nuclear discussion, but none, nobody in the country actually trusts 
government to, to run a clean tender process, particularly given the way Russia operates in the world. Uh, coal is, uh, sorry, nuclear is not necessarily a dirty a dirty option. And the way you prevent it otherwise is, is uh, you know, I mean, the, the power ships is another whole discussion, which I'd like to have Paul comment on about what, why that's being pushed so hard by, by government to get these power ships in, which is going to produce carb, carbon emissions for 20 years uh, from gas production, gas power production. Um, so how do we do it? We do it through the political uh, process, through the regulatory process, through national initiatives, through our international uh, commitments to reduce carbon emissions, perhaps through that, some of that green funding. Nescom is going to gobble up if they can get it from the world and the commitments you make in those regards. And that's all I've got. But uh, Paul, Paul, we had an interesting discussion yesterday about the, about the power ships. And I was arguing that, hey, on a five to seven year transition, maybe we should just do it because we need power on the grid now. You made a counter argument that you would never fund a power ship. So if you look at the alternatives that 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 we have, and I mean these are alternatives that were awarded alongside the power ships in the emergency round, uh, wind and, and solar and battery combination uh, came in at exactly the same price as as car power ships, and they came in with fixed investment into South Africa, lasting fixed investment that will ensure that there's job creation locally um, and it's ongoing. Whereas the power ships are located offshore and there's no fixed investment. There's no real fixed investment. You know, when those contracts are ended with those car power ships, they, they'll just move on to the next country and we'll have lost a, a huge opportunity for fixed investment there. Yeah, can I just come in too also to say that, uh, you know, uh, the price bid in the non-car power ship project was largely linked over 20 years to the consumer price index in terms of price escalation of the bid rate. In the case of the car power ships, 60% uh, of that price bid of 150 approximately is linked to the rand dollar rate of exchange and the price of LNG in US dollars. And if this these car power ships were delivering power into the grid today. Uh, if the process had not been stalled and they were delivering into today, based on the, the, the current rate of exchange and the current LNG price, it would be delivering power into the grid at six rand a kilowatt hour. And that additional price is a pass through to the customer. So uh, you've got to understand it's not a fixed price in rands per kilowatt hour. It's linked to different indices, and in the case of COP power ships, it's linked to the rand dollar exchange rate and the US dollar price of LNG. At the moment, if you follow the graph of the LNG price over the last six months, it's a terrible shape. It's just going up like a rocket. It's like it's 10 times higher than it was uh, you know, a year ago. Uh, and that is the volatility. And remember, <laughs> it's a non-renewable source. Over 20 years, what do you expect the rand to do? What do you expect the dollar price of LNG to do? Uh, we know what it's, the oil price has done over the last 20 years. What do we expect in the next 20 years? That's the kind of decision that what we make when you adjudicate tenders. You don't adjudicate them on the price today. You, you, you have to start thinking about, uh, about the volatility uh, of, of the input costs. Uh, in this case, the fuel. The fuel is the problem. In the case of battery storage and wind and solar, there is no fuel. It's just capital costs. So you link to the interest rate and uh, and, and CPI and you know, for labor and things like that. So it's much more stable. So, Chris, I have to ask you then, given what Paul yep. just said, that the alternatives came in, wind, solar and battery came in at the same price on the face of the power ships. You say the power ships come with all this long term risk, which none of us want to bear. How did they win 1.8 gigawatts of capacity? I don't get it. I mean, are, should we, are we seeing shadows of corruption here? Is that what the, I mean, is that ultimately well, what we're making allegations of? I, I don't know the answer, but other people are suggesting, uh, uh, you know, fraudulent activities. I'm not suggesting it. I don't know. I just look at the facts to say this cannot make sense. And I don't think that Treasury is going to sign off on this project. Nor do I think that Eskim is going to sign a power purchase agreement. Eskim have told me they will not sign a power purchase agreement until they have a cost iron guarantee that any fuel price increases will be passed on to somebody else and not Eskim. Eskim want this clear. 
that they are not, they cannot take the risk. They will not bear the risk. And unless there is a cast iron guarantee in place that they don't have to bear the risk, they will not sign a PPA. They would be in breach of the fiduciary duties to take on such a risk in their current financial circumstances. Okay. Thanks, Chris. Should we not consider having more technical skills in these finance providers to allow for proper evaluation of these critical ESG metrics? Paul? I think there is a case for that. Um, you know, I, I I don't think it's rocket science either. I mean, we, we we've spent a lot of time getting to understand this. Um, but to maybe roll it out across the industry and ensure that there's consistency, um, there, there could be a, a place for external um, parties. Um, Andrew, do you have any views on that? I'm not, a bit, I'm not a big fan of outsourcing any sort of analysis, whether it's credit ratings or ESG analysis. I think each investor has to do their own work on these things, ask the right mm -hmm. questions, put it into the room, particularly as lenders, we have the great power to put in not just financial metrics, but various other covenants and reporting requirements, which we do as lenders quite frequently. Um, um, yeah, outsourcing to me is always a weak answer, but you know that. Okay. One last Andrew, question. Is there... Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, Andrew. Would you call it? Would you call it a weak answer though? If, in a way, you're sort of trying to influence behavior of finance of finance providers, um, where you never really have a wide gap in what they present to, you know, counterparties, as as commercial terms. So if look in a small if, group in a small group of lenders, we can work collaboratively, and sometimes you have good co-creditors who want to work with you and sometimes you have co-creditors who couldn't really care less about environmental, social and governance factors. So that's a circumstantial thing. If you talk about broader capital market, there's this dividing line between informed parties setting but setting the rules and other people riding the bus. And there comes a point where things get too broad, where things are in the broad market and nobody actually has any control. And we see that in JSC listing standards, in the use of credit ratings and the use of ESG ratings globally. So there's this, there, there is that tipping point where you go over the line to a broader capital market. I think at this point we're in a narrow universe and you can get more leverage with a relatively narrow group of funders funding very large scale projects and inserting, inserting uh, ESG standards into that. And the last question is, is there opportunity in underground coal bed gasification for gas production? Or is it pending environment? Is it a pending environmental disaster? There's much better to go renewable. Some people believe that coal bed gasification is the answer. They generally have commercial vested interest in that technology and they are determined that it should happen and they will argue passionately that this is a solution for South Africa. Uh, but my personal view is that it's not. Uh, and I, I know in Botswana, I've seen these, uh, uh, they be, I call them uh, evangelists of one form or another. You can be a nuclear evangelist, you can be a coal event, you can be a coal bed methane evangelist, and they are out there. But I personally don't see this as a solution for South Africa in view of uh, climate change, uh, you know, we're talking about coal bed methane here. Leakage, this is a problem. <laughs> Thank you, panelists. Very insightful conversation. I do trust that those who have stayed behind have uh, taken away a lot in terms of we do need to make this transition to clean coal. I'm sorry, not clean coal, uh, to clean energy. <laughs> sorry. I was just checking if everybody's awake. <laughs> clean energy. <laughs> Thank you very much and have a lovely day further. <laughs> Thanks, Marciavi. Thank Thanks, everybody. Yes, cheers. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.